records uh, speak of you. Um, so basically myself and Karen and Charlie will be, will be featuring there. Um, if you'd like any more information on our virtual wine events, then go to lathwaites.co.uk uh, forward slash virtual events. And there's a list of things that are coming up and that's being uh, updated um, uh, weekly, I would say. I know there's a cheese and wine event for early September. That's probably going to go on tomorrow, if not Monday. Um, so for those of you that don't know you, my name's Grant. I uh, work for Lathwaites and have done since 2012. I'm a wine educator and uh, a wine host. Um, so this is very much my bag, so I hope I don't bore you, bore you guys to tears. Uh, the format of this evening will be as follows. Hopefully you're already enjoying your wine and your olives. Um, <clears throat> I'll introduce Karen and Charlie, uh, and they will tell us a little bit about uh, the Real Olive Company and uh, the olive selections that they've chosen for us uh, for this evening. Uh, and then back over to me, I'll introduce the first wine, which will be the, uh, the Pinot Grigio uh, that you guys will got, will be the first wine. Um, I'll share a screen with that because I've got a little uh, PowerPoint presentation with some details about the wine. Um, and then uh, back over to uh, Karen and Charlie if there's anything else they'd like to say, what you'd like to say about that particular um, um, selection of olives. Um, and then back to me again for the second wine and so on and so forth. And uh, we'll be discussing ide ideas and some principles behind matching, uh, why we think uh, uh, certain wine goes well. Uh, with uh, with certain olives. Um, so, as I say, around about 40 minutes and then some questions at the end. So, what I'm going to do now um, is introduce uh, Karen and Charlie from The Real Olive Company and let them tell you about uh, their work and their passion. Hello, Karen. Hello, Charlie. Hi. Hi. So, I'm Karen, co-founder of The Real Olive Company. I'm Charlie and I work within the company um, creating and inventing new food ideas. So yes, yeah, lovely to see you guys this evening. Thank you so much for being here. We've been really excited about this. Very. And we're going to try not to get too drunk too quickly. Okay, <laughs> could be hard. But yeah, I just briefly wanted to introduce you to the Real Olive Company to start off with. So me and my partner Ben, who's looking after our kids in the house, we set up the Real Olive Company in 1998 after having been traveling just abroad, seeing all this wonderful, really inspired um, by all amazing produce. So we, we just came back to the UK wanting to bring all fresh olives and antipasti to, to the UK. We set up a stall in St. Nicholas Market in Bristol in yeah, 1998, quite a long time ago. Um, and then we had quite a lot of chefs coming to us who really wanted us to supply them. So we kind of organically grew and started to supply into restaurants. And then um, in 2001, we set up a restaurant called the Olive Shed on the harbour side in Bristol, together with Charlie. So I got involved in, um, we had a right laugh. We did. And <laughs> I was head chef and uh, it was good, hard work, good days, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So Charlie is an amazing, amazing chef. A proper sort of foodie and uh, yeah if you've got any questions about how to use olives with food then he's the man later on. So um, yeah moving on to where we are right now we still buy from the same suppliers that we've been buying from for the past 20 years and um, we've been working primarily with organic and smaller growers and farmers because we, we kind of really value the relationships that we built up over the years they support us through sort of harder times and we support them through those times and it's to us like one of the most important aspects of the whole business actually. Um, then when we get the olives to Bristol we, we desalinate and prepare the olives and marinade and then we pack them all in, in our production site in Bristol just up the road from here actually and then they go out into shops like this all across the UK. Um, so yeah this, the blends that we've chosen this evening are quite summary blends. We sort of went for some things that we felt would work well with lighter wines. So to start with, uh, one of my favourites, we've got Nocciolara del Belize. Lovely. Yeah, actually open these. Lovely, lovely olive. And they are really famous olive, like a special variety that just grows in Val del Belize in southwest of Sicily. And they've been growing there for nearly 3,000 years. Uh, our Nocciolara olives come from a family that was um, established in 1916 and they're totally dedicated to organic, biodynamic and GM3 farming and are complete perfectionists 
and passionate about their produce. So yeah, so we totally we love them. We've been buying from them the whole the whole time really. I must so, say I do like them. your new packaging. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, let's get them open. There we go, not Shanara. They look so good. They are actually a little bit smaller this year than some years. And it all depends depends on the weather conditions. So sometimes if you don't get the rain at the right time, they don't they don't expand. So it's always sort of various, but uh, they still have like the, the most amazing taste and the sort of al dente texture that uh, we love. So that was the first one. The second one we've chosen is our most popular blend. It's called La Verde with wild garlic and basil um, and a little bit of fresh, oh, I'm passing those here. Thank you. With a bit of fresh garlic as well. Uh, they, they've been our most popular sellers for years actually. They're just delicious. Um, we use a variety of olives to this, two different varieties. So at the beginning of the year, we use a Spanish olive called Gudal, which is grown just outside Seville, kind of the Seville region. Um, Cause it just, as the olives mature, they sort of change throughout the year and the Gudal works better sort of January, February time. And then later on, we start to use Halkadiki, which is what we have currently in, in our La Verde pots. So that's what you'll be eating tonight. They are, yeah, they're probably the most delicious Greek olive grown in Northern Greece. Um, they just have a really good texture, really easy to pit. Mm. So they're very popular for stuffing. Um, because some olives with funny sort of shapes and funny shaped pits are very hard to pit. And you end up with tiny bits of fragment of stones. So yeah, these are probably, yeah, one of the favorites I would say mm. worldwide. They're really meaty, aren't they? They are very meaty, on it. And then our, yeah, our third blend of the evening is the Siciliana olives. They are a Greek blend of olives in a Sicilian marinade. So they are marinated with, with like peppers and mustard seeds, uh, herb de Provence. Again, we're using Halkadiki olives and the Kalamata. Uh, because Kalamata olives have had issues in the past. So they, the crops have been quite small. We've had to reduce the quantity of Kalamata. So actually in our blends, it does vary quite, it can really vary depending on the pot, but we always have a smaller quantity of Kalamata in these um, just because of the availability. Um, and we, because we tend to work, everything is so seasonal with olives. Um, and I think a lot of people sort of forget about that, but they are only only cropped once a year and and they sort of they're fermented for about three months until you can until they're ready to eat um, and both the Halkadiki and uh, the Godal are both cropped in around October November time and they're ready to eat sort of around February but they will have they'll be completely different at that time of year to six months later and they'll be a lot softer and mellower so that's why sometimes when you buy them you'll think oh this is a completely different olive but it's just when when the when the sort of seasonality changes and we get the new the new harvest in like the black olives will be really bitter in january february time uh which some people love and others find quite hard so it's worth to, to know that because they are a natural fruit, they're fresh, unpasteurized, and they carry on fermenting throughout the whole year, which is what makes them really special. So yeah, I don't know if I've talked too much. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Go on, it's really interesting what you know about olives. Uh, yeah, yeah might... it's really interesting about the sort of seasonality, which obviously we don't really have with wine. I mean, we have different vintages, but uh, you know, yeah. I, yeah, I imagine there's, uh, it, it can be quite difficult for you guys. You've got to be sort of fairly, um, <clears throat> you've got to move around a lot with your thinking, be quite flexible in your thinking and your marketing and stuff as a result. Yeah, I mean, which is why we do buy the Spanish olives as well as the Greek, because mm. there's been so many ups and downs in, in crops and yields over the past few years. Some really serious freak weather last year, the hailstorms and yeah. I mean, you, you'll talk to the growers in, May, June, and they're really positive, and then suddenly something happens in August, and it takes out a quarter of their crops. So, yeah, for us, the whole thing about supporting our growers and farmers is, is really important because they're, 
you know, they're quite vulnerable because it's, it's a once a year crop and they're relying on, on selling all of those olives. So yeah, it feels like to us, that's the sustainability part of the business, making sure everybody can actually make a living at this and it's not us just, you know, trying to reap the rewards this end and going to like the big processes. So we just tend to deal with people who are gonna you know, benefit directly from yeah. us buying from them. Mm. Yeah, I think I mean, Lakeweights have a similar ethos. You know, you know, there's there's, there's people that we've been dealing with for, for decades, um, so it's very much something we do. And that thing about sustainability is important. So going to someone and buying their wines, even in the less good vintages. Um, so just being there and buying their wines, even though the vintage is not very good, uh, not being a fair weather wine buyer. So just going looking for yeah. wines during the best vintages. You know. Yeah. 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 I mean, it can be tricky because obviously you always want to keep the top quality, but generally. If you you know, get bad crop uh, across the whole of Greece, then obviously everybody's suffering mm -hmm. with the same, the same issues. So, cool. yeah. Nice. So um, I'm going to um, I'm going to share a screen with you and just tell you about um, the first wine, which is the um, Sentiero di Pini. It's uh, uh, Pinot Grigio um, from Venezia uh, in the north uh, west of Italy. Um, so there's our little. Here comes our little presentation. I slaved over this. Hope you guys enjoy it. Um, so first off, this uh, Pinot Grigio. So Pinot Grigio really needs little introduction in the UK. So together with Sauvignon Blanc, it makes up uh, the most popular wine style, which is sort of light uh, and fresh um, uh, wines. Um, so probably um, Sauvignon Blanc is slightly more, um, there's slightly more demand for Sauvignon Blanc than Pinot Grigio. Uh, but the two of them are massively popular in the UK. Um, so Pinot Grigio is also uh, known as Pinot Gris. Um, so Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris are the same grape variety. And you also find, of course, Pinot Grigio blush. Um, so firstly, the different styles, Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio. Well, the first, the French name, uh, and the second, the Italian name. Uh, but as well as that, it, um, so, Pinot Gris tends to be grown in France and Pinot Grigio in Italy. It's also uh, very different stylistically. So Pinot Gris tend to be really rich and really honeyed and really textured wines. Um, typically, they're made a lot in Alsace um, in uh, the northeast of France. Pinot Grigio, conversely, tend to be light, fresh, sort of citrusy uh, and maybe a little bit floral. Uh, and then Pinot Grigio Blush, you might be wondering how you can make uh, a, a rosé from a, a white grape. Well, um, Pinot Grigio grapes actually go a little bit sort of like um, pinkish, uh, ambery sort of colour when they get ripe. They're related to Pinot Noir. Um, so like Pinot Noir, when they get ripe, they get a little bit, uh, a little bit sort of pinkish, sort of a pinkish hue. Uh, and then, of course, they just leave that slightly pinkish skin in contact with the wine for a little bit. Uh, it's called maceration to extract a little bit of the colour. But basically, Pinot Gris, tropical, rich, um, spicy often, um, and textured, higher alcohol, lower acidity. Pinot Grigio, light, fresh, uh, floral, citrusy, tend to be lower in alcohol and fresher. And this is a great example of that. They tend to be, Pinot Grigio now, they tend to be fermented in stainless steel uh, tanks. So in a way, it's a very pure um, wine that we are drinking because it hasn't been oaked or it hasn't been Lee's aged, or there's lots of different techniques which a winemaker might use, but they don't tend to use them with Pinot Grigio. So it's a very honest, straightforward um, grape variety. Mm. As I mentioned, earlier harvests tend to make uh, for lighter wines, and Pinot Grigios are harvested relatively early, so they want to have that acidity and that freshness and that lightness uh, of alcohol. It's really important uh, for the wine and the demands of the market. They tend to be fairly straightforward, although around the north of Italy, particularly, particularly sort of Alto Adige, around towards uh, Slovenia, you tend to get um, some really quite high quality Pinot Grigios, but still nothing more than sort of 20, 25 pounds a bottle uh, generally. Um, this one um, comes from uh, Alto Adige, sorry, the Adige Valley, uh, which runs from the Alps down towards the Adriatic. And those two influences are really, really important um, for the vineyards of that area. So 
uh, both the sea and the Alps. Uh, they keep the vineyards nice and cool, enabling the grapes to ripen nice and slowly, and most importantly, to retain their acidity. And the region is so well suited to Pinot Grigio that 70% uh, of, uh, of the region's wine uh, is Pinot Grigio. Um, now on the nose for this wine, uh, if, you've, if you've got the wine, you can have a little swirl and a sniff. It is very light and very delicate. Um, it will be a little bit more forthcoming as it warms up a little bit if you've just got it out of the fridge. Uh, but I've got wildflowers, green apples and lemon. So really, really straightforward uh, tasting notes. And this is sort of textbook Pinot Grigio, uh, if you like. And then onto the palette, just going to remind myself. Makes for great viewing when, you're, when your host is drinking. Um, and then onto the palette, again, quite simple, uh, lemons and green apples, and it's fresh and it's light. Um, and we paired this with, um, with the organic uh, Nocciolara and uh, del, uh, del Belice olives. How's my pronunciation? Pretty rubbish, I think. Uh, I think it's probably better than mine. <laughs> uh, and I mean, when I was when I was trying the wine and I was trying the olives, uh, so the olives I, th I found were really sort of quite sort of um, quite subtle and quite delicate. So I didn't want a wine with a lot of power. I wanted something light uh, and something fresh because I found the olives quite sort of refreshing too. Um, so I was very very careful of having choosing something light because I didn't want to under sort of overpower uh, the sort of lovely light of the flavours uh, of the olive. So um, I, made, I made some tasting notes on the olive. Do you make tasting notes on olives, Karen? Yeah, go on then. Okay, right, here we go. I'm, I'm ready to be slated. So um, first one was easy. In the wine, wine, we tend to talk about something being green, which is just to suggest nice sort of vegetal um, aromas or flavors. So I've got green, it's a little bit nutty, um, obviously very crunchy and fresh, but basically vegetal, nutty and green uh, on, yeah. my, on, my, on my tasting notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we also would add probably creamy, mm -hmm. uh, sort of buttery. Mm. Um, uh, they're often served on ice. There's a, you know, often quite chilled, the nocciolara, which is unusual for olives, because most olives are really nice at room temperature, but mm. with nocciolara, they, they're also an early harvest um, crop. So they kind of harvested early in September time. And they are only um, they're only left to to mature for ten to twenty five days, which um, which is again really unusual because they haven't got any bitterness like most olives have. Mm, they're really buttery. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm really getting from these ones in particular um, is that asparagus flavour. As soon as you put mm. into them, that fresh, nice, nice buttered asparagus. Asparagus, mm. and then you get the sour. There's a citrusy citrus coming yeah. after, mm -hmm. which is perfect, isn't it? It's a really good pairing, I think. Yeah, mm. and then to have the wine to go with that, like you said, Grant, mm. it just kind of it cleans cleans the palate and it makes the, the whole thing work together with the yeah. sour notes and, and everything. Mm. Yeah. I really like um, tasting with people who, who maybe know more about the subject than I do. So whether it's friends who work in beer or spirits or you guys with olives, because making my notes this afternoon, I hadn't thought about creamy. But then yeah, as soon yeah. as you guys said the buttery and creamy, then, oh, yeah, OK, then I really, really get that. So um, it's almost like I've got to like adjust my palate slightly or just yeah, tune yeah. my palate in differently. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. Really nice. So no, I think. No. Um, go on, Charlie. I was just thinking, um, they go well, I think they will go well as well. So obviously, if we introduce cheeses and things like that into the, into the mix, I think they're great, something like that. Even as an aperitif, sitting here now, some little cheese straws, I was thinking, mm. just to add that extra cheesy butteriness to go with it. I think they're great for that. They've got such a good use all around in salads and everything else, these nocturnals, because they're so juicy as well. They've got that lovely fruity juiciness about them. Nice. They're a winner, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. I hear it's a good, it's a good pairing for, um, for sherry, in particular sort of manzanilla sherry. You have your almonds and your, and your olives, and then you sort of like set up, uh, yeah. set up for the evening. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And if you, do you, would you cook with this or would you just tend to, these olives, or would you just tend to use them sort of as a, an aperitif? 
I, I think like as an aperitif like this, they're perfect. That's what made me think of something on the side as well to eat. And because they've got the, um, uh, they're not pitted. Um, I suppose if you had a pitted mushalara, which you, I suppose, I well, don't know, the, I've never seen one really, have you? Uh, the stone is quite, you can get them, but the stone is really big. Okay. So that causes the, the olive to crack. Uh -huh. So if you've got a really big olive, a big stone in, in an olive, it just, it just creates too big a hole. Basically. It would probably compromise that juiciness as well, with yeah. that fresh. Yeah, yeah. But if you could cook with them, I suppose just straight into pasta, wouldn't it? With a wonderful wine like this and a, a nice spaghetti with some herbs and some, some lemon and, and a bit of fish. fish. Perfect, yeah. Really well, like, <laughs> yeah. Nice yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, perfect with a bit of burrata cheese and that lovely creamy cheese as well. Oh, nice, yeah. That would yeah. absolutely. That would be a winner. Um, they're just great. Yeah. When when the olives are, you mentioned earlier on that this this crop was quite small. Does that do anything to the flavours uh, at all? I think it, it intensifies it a little bit. So you're getting more like more intense flavours. So sometimes, obviously, if you're getting more water into the harvest just right. before the harvest, you know, into the crop just before the harvest time, the olives sort of swell swell up. And obviously, it has a bit more water in it, and and perhaps mm. dilute the flavour a little bit. Whereas, I think these are quite they are a really good flavour. Yeah. yeah. Nice, like them, like them. Great. Um, right, let's go on to our next uh, our next uh, wine, our next pairing. So, incidentally, for all of you guys uh, listening in, have a think about whilst we go through your favourite wine, uh, your favourite olive, and then your favourite your favorite pairing. And then um, as we get towards the end, obviously you can share your thoughts in the chat or we can talk about them uh, later on. So um, in the, the blog post when we're advertising this event, we talked about what grows together, goes together. Um, and of course we've got uh, olives from, uh, a lot of olives from Italy, but also from Greece and from Spain, uh, places that you would find uh, olives typically. Um, and um, of course it made sense to go with the Italian wine. Um, this wine has got a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a nod to Greece as well. This is one of my favorite Italian white wine regions. So it's uh, Greco di Tufo is the name of the region and you might see the little map down there. There's a tiny little red dot um, and that is where we are. So very close to Naples or Napoli. Um, and the grape variety is Greco and it's grown mainly in Campania. So Campania is the region that contains Naples and contains Greco di Tufo, but also in uh, Basilicata, uh, Calabria and Puglia. So that's all around the sort of foot, so the toe and the ball of the foot, the instep and the heel, it's also grown around there. And typical of many Italian grape varieties, in fact I'd say most Italian grape varieties, it's only really grown there um, and nowhere else in the world certainly and not many other places uh, in Italy too. So it has its origins from uh, the, the Greeks, basically. Ancient Greeks brought it over to Italy. And um, our, one of our winemakers, Alessandro Galici, was, was telling me how the Greeks taught the Italians or taught the Romans how to make, uh, how to make wine. So uh, the Greeks brought it over and hence the name Greco uh, di Tufo. It's a late ripening grape uh, variety and it has very high acid. So it's really, really fresh. The best examples of it, uh, we're, we're tasting the, the best example here really. So it is around the town of Tufo. So that's where the region takes its name from, uh, the Greco de Tufo. And that is one of eight towns that can use the DOCG name Greco de Tufo. And a really, really important factor here are the soils. So the volcanic soils are a crucial, crucial factor. So it's quite, it's quite warm um, down in Campania and um, the volcanic soils, they don't heat up the same way that other soil types, so clay or limestone soils, let's say, heat up. So in warmer uh, regions, volcanic soil can enable them to make really sort of lovely, fresh sort of style of white wine, which might not, other, which might not be possible otherwise. So that's a really important factor um, in, in Greco de Tufo. And the name of the town, Tufo, it actually takes its name from the type of soil. The volcanic soil is called Tufo. Uh, spelled differently, uh, but it is called Tufo, uh, the soil type there. 
So again, another wine that is uh, fermented in stainless steel um, and has a low temperature fermentation. And those two factors together, they combine just to help retain the natural essence of the grape, if you like. So the fruit character um, and the freshness uh, in the wine. So I would put it up there. I'd also mention the same breadth of Italian white wines, um, Gavi or Gavi di Gavi. Um, they really are sort of standout um, Italian white wines that you associate great value, but also consistently good quality. Uh, and for me, uh, Gavi and the Greco di Tufo, you know, those are the two uh, um, most obvious examples of that of Italian wines and two of my favorite uh, Italian wines. So my tasting notes uh, for the wine there. So on the nose, a bit of lemon rind, peach and pear drops. So something a little bit confected. Um, so this vintage, um, I haven't actually looked at the vintage charts, but this wine seems a little bit more ripe in terms of its fruit flavor and character. So that sort of peach and pear drop um, flavors or aromas certainly, I wasn't finding previously. So 2018, 2017 and maybe 16, uh, I've had of this wine as well. So it, uh, I'm wondering if it was a little bit warmer for them because it is a bit more expressive and a little bit riper on the nose than it's been uh, previously. And then onto the palate, lemon rind, peach uh, and almonds. And we've paired this with the organic La Verde olives with wild garlic. And I've written olives twice there. They're beautiful olives. Yeah. Beautiful wine. Beautiful mm. Goes yeah, it's, it's really good to see. Actually, it's like after having a good lunch, I always mm. thought it was really good. That's <laughs> like this one. We've been so enjoying these mm. wines, mm. <laughs> and this one, this pairing, I think, is great. They're all great. But this one, this mm. one is really good. They complement complement each other so well. I think you'll know more about the the kind of heritage of those olives, but for me, they're. The meatiness is great. Uh, maybe not as juicy as the Nashalara, but the, the mm. texture, I really like the texture. And what you've done with the garlic, the wild garlic, that really comes through, which I think works so well with the wine. And, and the wine can handle that because it's a bit more full-bodied. Mm. I think it's a great combination. Yeah. Yeah, the basil complements as well. The sort of sweetness, it's like the sweetness in the olives. These are actually, I hope, Sorry, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, no, no, you're not. Sorry. Mm. Well, they quite, they have got a little bit of acidity. They also have a bit more. There's a bit of sweetness to these olives, and they also, although they are juicy, there's like a dry kind yeah. of finish in the yeah. of them, and they just seem to they work really well with the marinades, and they just take on flavours really well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like to use them in, I would make salsas and throw them into sauces because they can handle anything. I was maybe mm. making um, a, a chicken dish, a chicken, chicken tagine with preserved lemon and those olives and things like that. They really handle, they stand up with anything. Mm, really good with chicken actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Yeah. And at the moment, with a glut of tomatoes you've got on a bruschetta, chop some of those up or make a salsa with them. They're just so versatile. It's almost anything you've got in the fridge or around, they will go with. And um, quite easily, I will sit there and finish a whole pot, no problem. <laughs> They're really, really sumptuous. You mentioned meaty. They are really, you know, there's a real sort of mouthful to them. Yeah. Um, the, um, it's interesting. One thing I meant to mention about um, Greco de Tufo was how it, it's almost got this texture, uh, like a, a more viscous, certainly a more viscous texture than the, than the Pinot Grigio. Uh, yeah. But it does have a little bit of a sort of a, yeah, it's a little bit more textured. I was going to say honey texture there, but that might mislead people. But there is, it is a bit more textured and I think that works really well. And then the fruit. So this wine is, you know, far more fruity, I would say, more ripe fruit character, um, mm. certainly than the Pinot Grigio. And my, my first instinct for all like, I trying to choose the match was the, the wild garlic, you know, which is quite a strong flavour. So you need something. But there's a, there's a, like you say, there's a sweetness in the olive as well. That goes well with the uh, the sweet fruit character and the wine. Mm. I think it's uh, it's yummy. I would like to drink that whilst walking through a field of wild garlic. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm there walking through the woods. A glass of that. Yeah, that was that. Yeah. Mm. 
I like the uh, I like the tagine uh, idea. And when, as soon as you mentioned preserved lemons, I was right there with you with these olives. I thought, wow, uh, amazing. Mm. Yeah, well, it's a good place. You know, there's a good place for people to buy preserved lemons. It's quite sort of um, uh, it's quite sort of niche, isn't it? I mean, do they have them in the supermarkets? Preserved. Um, lemons? I find I have found them. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you get you do get them. You do get them in that little speciality aisle. Yeah. At the back in the corner somewhere. Um, okay. But yeah, a good deli, obviously. But um, mm. I think um, you can make your own. Um, if you, <laughs> it's a bit of process. You have to wait a few months, but it's worth it. But they yeah, keep we... these. I've got a jar in the fridge, actually. They, they keep. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to chop these up all the time into the pastas and things for the kids and on mm. pizzas because they just seem to love. They just seem to love the green olives and that flavour. This seems to go down well with everyone. That blend, it's mm. just the most, I mean, it is the most popular blend that we have. Just everyone seems to love it. And yeah, just chop them up, pop them into anything, salads, you know, like nice quinoa or spelt salads. Yeah. yeah. So it adds so much flavour. They're a good all rounder, I think, aren't mm. they? Um, nice. yeah, they're, they're super. I'm with you. I could go through the pot. I think they're um, yeah something really they about them. they're nearly gone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gone right. Cool. We should let's move on to our last our last wine our last uh, our last pairing, um, and then um, and then we'll take uh, questions and whatnot uh, from people. So here we are, the Villa del Lardi uh, Langi Rosso from 2016. Um, <clears throat> so this is a blend of two. Uh, different grape varieties and um, there are a number of reasons why a winemaker might decide on, on a blend um, but the most obvious one is that they take um, aspects, flavour and aroma aspects or structural aspects like acidity, alcohol uh, and, from, and then they blend them because they sort of want the best of both wor worlds. So Nebbiolo for instance has high tannin, high acidity, um, it's also early flowering and late ripening which is rare but you want to but you but you blend that with something more supple and more fruity uh, like the Barbera. So that's the reason that blend works. You've got the high tannin and acidity from Nebbiolo and the slightly more supple, softer uh, Barbera. Um, so a little bit more about uh, Nebbiolo, because I briefly mentioned early flowering and late ripening. That's really quite rare and can be quite troublesome. So normally you would find a grape variety that uh, flowers early, and ripens early, like Merlot, for instance, or one that flowers late and ripens late, like Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and that is another reason that you might want to blend, is that even if you have a really poor um, spring, uh, frost or bad weather, or conversely a really poor autumn, which would generally be uh, lots of rain, um, then winemakers can still uh, get some crop and make some wine. So that's another reason for a blend, apart from the sort of flavour, aroma and structural aspects, is also just pure economics. So people being able to harvest and to make, uh, and to make a wine. Um, Nebbiolo is very elegant and perfumed. So the most famous examples we, we find of Nebbiolo are Barolo. So Barolo is uh, a small region of Langi, so Langi where this wine uh, comes from, it's a sub-region of Langi, and they make some of the most sought after uh, red wines in the world, very age worthy uh, and delicious. Um, so Barbera, as I mentioned, it ripens earlier and is more supple and generally more gentle. And some of the best examples you find of Barbera, again within this region, uh, there are two towns called Alba and Asti, and uh, they make some really, really lovely Barbera wines that are fantastic value. If you get an opportunity to try a Barbera de Alba or Barbera de Asti, I'd recommend it. I haven't been disappointed yet. Um, so where it's from, so Piedmont. Um, sometimes it's referred to the Burgundy of Italy because um, a lot of the production there is smaller producers and family producers as it is in Burgundy. It might also be a nod to uh, the quality of the wines there that they produce. Obviously, Burgundy produces very high quality uh, wines. Uh, and uh, Piedmont, I would say, for the whole of Italy, maybe with the exception of, uh, of Tuscany, um, is you know, the area that produces the highest quality uh, red wines uh, in Italy. 
Now, Langi is a sub-region uh, of uh, Piedmont that contains Barolo, Barbaresco, Alba, and Asti. And here you've got uh, a few really important factors. You've got the Western Alps, uh, and then also you've got the Apennine Mountains, sort of to just to the east, where it says Langi, on my little uh, on my little map there, at the northern Apennines. So you've got lots of these are really important factors for the vineyards, um, keeping them cool so they have nice long uh, ripening um, seasons, um, and enables them to make better quality wine ultimately. Uh, but it's one of the regions in the world that makes the most um, delicious and elegant restrained and often complex wines um, and most of those from these two great varieties here in terms of the reds, the Nebbiolo and the Barbera. Within the region Dolcetto is another great variety that you might, might see that is quite, uh, that is quite delicious um, but these are the main two great varieties and we've got a lovely blend of them here. So the tasting notes, well firstly onto the nose so cherries, yeah, lots of sort of sort of sour cherry um, aromas, a uh, little bit of smoke, and there's something a little bit floral about it. So I've um, I've gone with like a slightly sort of violety um, uh, aroma there as well, uh, and then also some plums, and then onto the palate. Typical Italian red, loads of acidity. Uh, which make it a great food wine, uh, but cherries, licorice, and there's a minerality to it, almost like a flinty, stony sort of character, and a little bit of pepper there as well. And uh, we've paired it with uh, Sicil Siciliana olives, uh, with garlic, peppers, and mustard seeds. Mm. Has anyone tried the match yet? I haven't, I've been chatting. Yeah, yeah no, I think, you know, I think the olives are quite bit. They have a slight bitterness with the, the mustard seeds and the um, and the peppers. But although they are the same olive variety, these are halkidiki as well. They taste completely different in this in this blend. And um, yeah, it works. It works mm. really well with this wine. Mm. Well, I think that's a really mm. because you've got a lot more going on there. It's quite an exciting mix, and it's quite thrilling. You've got those. The herbs to Provence, is it? You've got yeah. mustard seed, peppers, I love these little green. Yeah, the green ones are my favourite. Green little pickledy pepper things. And there's a bit of warmth from the mustard mm. seed. So it, it's quite it's quite um it's quite an exciting mix. And then the wine just works with all those peppery notes like you were saying with the wine and yeah. Mm -hmm. I got it then, Grant, when you said about the cherries, the sour cherries. That's so right. Mm. Yeah, cherries is a big uh, is a big thing in Italian wine, also um, from Tempranillo in the north of Spain. But you know whether you're talking about a um, a Chianti or whether you're talking about a Nebbiolo or a Barbera, there's something about the Italian wines. They tend to be really sort of like cherry scented and often quite floral as well. Um, you know, which I which I love. And I really like the, always, I really like the freshness in Italian wines. Always super, super acidic. Mm. And I love food and I love wine. And, 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 and that just really helps things go together. Um, it, it's not always the go-to choice for, uh, for people drinking in the UK. Um, and I'm going to qualify that a little bit. Because I think we, di we drink slightly differently than people do uh, in Italy. So my girlfriend is from Italy. And she says, you, you can tell when there's a table of English people in a restaurant in Italy, uh, or even not at a restaurant, at a, at, a, at a bar, you know, there'll be there'll be wine and beer, whatever, everywhere, and not a scrap of food, uh, which for the, the Italians is quite shocking, you know, because the two go together hand in hand, you know, from when you're eight years old, you'll have a splash of wine with your glass of water at the dinner table, uh, you know, with the family. So, you know, the food and wine is, is much more sort of ingrained uh, in, in, in the culture in, in, of Italy than it is in the UK where we might typically go to the pub and have a glass of wine, um, you know, something like that. So, um, yeah, so a lot of people struggle with that acidity in Italian wine. Sorry, Karen. Yeah, but yeah, you have to eat with it. And, and, mm. uh, and the thing about, you know, the Mediterranean diet, obviously in the Mediterranean, they drink as much as we do here, you know, but they, they eat their, their drinking and that makes such a major difference. And also, they use a lot of olive oil, and you know, traditionally, even drink olive oil, um, and that really helps 
helps to offset all of those kind of negative effects of alcohol. It really helps to support your, your liver. And, um, and, you know, even eating olives is really going to help that kind of eating olives with drinking is basically mm. going to offset some of the sort of negative effects of the alcohol. Mm. So we should, we should really all be drinking a little glass of olive oil as well. But just eating olives is definitely going to help. Nice. You guys sell olive oil as well, don't you? I we, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah. And we have, a, we have an in-house nutritionist um, and she, she does write quite a lot of interesting health blog posts. And she's done huge amounts of research. She's written a few books on, on longevity and the diets of the Mediterranean and yeah, some quite interesting things to so say if anyone wants to find out a bit more. Um, she's hilarious, she's got a very dry sense of humour, but um, yeah, she's, she's got quite a few posts about various benefits of the Mediterranean diet, specifically olive oil actually. But uh, it, does, you know, it does obviously work through olives as well. But in, you know, yeah, literally if you drank a little cup of extra virgin olive oil, you'd be fine. No hangovers tomorrow. Happy days, you heard it here first. Yeah. No matter how much you play. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, had a, I had a minging hangover. You said it'd be fine. I only drank three <laughs> bottles. Yeah. It was it was tricky, you know, to try and to try and choose a wine for that because there's you know there's quite a lot of different flavours with the different olives and also with the peppers um, uh, yeah. as well. It was it was a little bit it was a bit trickier uh, that one sort of picking a match. Mm. Um, I think because because of the other ones were you know there were more green olives. I think I sort of focused on the peppers uh, and the black olives a little bit more maybe when 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 choosing the wine to go with it because um, I thought you know with the black olives or the, you know that that sort of bitterness you wanted you needed a red wine. You needed you something really a little definitely. bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think um, I mean one of my favourite olives is Kalamata. And actually these in here have got that really yeah. lovely bitterness. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I mean, they definitely work really well yeah. with a red wine. And they're quite fruity as well, aren't they? Aren't they? I always think mm. kind of marshal thing. But they kind of, that bitterness is something that, you know, I think yeah. we as humans just, we just love it somehow. It's just, it's really, it's like a sign, but it's really good for us. Um, mm. It's bitter, it's, it's the, what's inside the olive, which is actually what is part of the benefit. The name that I've forgotten. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll come back to you. It happens to me regularly at tastings. Yeah. So um, I've got two more slides to show you guys. Nothing to do with uh, with wine, uh, but we're we're running a little competition, um, and um, you keep an eye out on social media. And there's a chance uh, of winning a bottle of wine from Lakeweights, and then a six pack, so an olive hamper uh, from uh, from the real olive company there. Um, can you guys remember off the top of your head what's in the hamper? Well, Cons it's around, I think, around six packs of olives. Um, yeah. Olive, um, there will be an olive um, ceramic dish, like a lovely, a bit of a dish like this, like an nice. olive dish with a stones dish next to it, uh, which is made by our local, a local ceramist, um, Rupert Blamere, actually. So we always, you know, we just like to pair those up with the olives. Um, and we we usually have a bit of pack there, uh, a bottle of olive oil, and possibly some balsamic vinegar. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's loads. I mean, we've got three of the olives we've tr tried today in the, in the pack there, it looks like. And also calamata. Yeah, they are delicious as well. Mm. Uh, is it tricolore olives? Is tricolore, that... yeah, they're slightly spicy. Nice. Yeah, they got a um, bit of a kick to them. And the casbah, which has got sort of um, a rose, rose water, they're sort of a Moorish flavour. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the whole sort of Medina, Moroccan mm. style nice. olives, which again are really good for cooking with because they just add so much flavour. And I think, yeah, the Siciliana, the Nocturnara, La Verde. Yeah. Nice. Sorry. So if you guys want to enter the competition, just keep an eye out on social media. Uh, there'll be a post um, uh, from Lathwaite's. So all you've got to do is like the post and then follow Lathwaite's.wine and at Real Olive Company uh, on Instagram. And then comment uh, on the post, this bit's important, with uh, uh, win wine and olives and include it's not actually on here but include a little wine glass uh, emoji there so win wine uh, and olives and include a little um, 
wine glass emoji. So there's a red wine emoji you'll find uh, on your phone. Um, the competition closes uh, a week today, so the 13th of August at uh, a minute to midnight. So good luck if you want to take part in that. And then um, there are our wines. Uh, thank you for joining us. But as, as a thank you for joining us, should you guys want to make uh, a purchase from the Real Olive Company, um, then they're offering a 25% discount uh, to the attendees via the online shop. So um, simply enter the code LW25ROCO. Um, I think at the checkout, um, uh, you will enter that code. Uh, and then the offer is running until the end of August.